Okay, so Santanu said, I'm Steve Mayfield. I'm from UC San Diego, and I've worked on algae for many years, maybe 30 years. And I realize maybe not everyone in this audience thinks about algae every day the way I do. So I, I'm going to break my talk down into, into three different basic parts. So the first part, I really want to explain to you why, you know, what the need for a, a new photosynthetic production platform is, where I think the problem, some of the challenges that the world is facing now that are going to get much more significant in the near future, and why I think with algae we have an opportunity to maybe address some of those. Um, I will say a little bit about biofuels. We <laughs> actually have made those. Uh, I'll tell you why they're, they're probably not going to be commercially available soon because it's cost. I'll tell you a little bit about some of the high value products that we've made in algae. And I think these offer some fantastic opportunities and in fact are a required stepping stone to get from where we are today to really large scale production. And then, you know, I, I realize that this is a biosafety meeting. So uh, I will actually spend a little bit of time at the end and describe an outdoor field trial that we did now almost two years ago uh, at UC San Diego of a genetically engineered algae. So it's the world's first EPA approved outdoor field trial. It may well not be the first outdoor field trial, but it was the first one at least approved by the EPA. Okay, so let's start with some, some pretty basic definitions here. Okay, so what is biomanufacturing? The title of my talk was Photosynthetic Biomanufacturing, okay? So that is simply the use of living organisms to produce useful products. Now this happens to be a picture of Cho cell ferment, oops, sorry. Th these are Cho cell fermentation tanks. So Cho cells, Chinese hamster ovary cells, for whatever reason, are what is used by the industry to produce recombinant proteins. And these ones are in Genentech's facility, uh, which is in Oceanside, California, very close to us. And they produce a monoclonal antibody in there. But some of you might recognize that this looks very similar to the vats that are used to produce beer. And so that's also biomanufacturing, right? You're, we're using a, a living organism to produce something we want. Now importantly, agriculture is also biomanufacturing. It is the use of living organisms to produce things we want. Whether that is wheat, as shown in, in the left-hand corner, or whether it's dairy cows. And these are heavily modified organisms. One thing that I'm always shocked by is people say, oh, well, you work on genetically modified organisms. Well, I have news for you. We all eat genetically modified organisms every day. We simply did it by breeding or mutagenesis or selection. They are heavily modified, okay? What we do today is engineer, more precisely modify those organisms. And then the bottom slide is simply a picture of the production facility of Sapphire Energy. That is a company I started about 10 years ago with the idea of making biofuels. That is a 100-acre facility, which is down in Columbus, New Mexico, uh, sort of in the middle of the United States. And uh, just for a scale, that's about three quarters of a kilometer wide by almost two kilometers long. And uh, today they actually produce algae in it, but they use it for a high value product. Okay, so also in my title I had, you know, algae is food and fuel for the 21st century. So why did we think of these two things together and why is it important that they are together? Well, first of all, they're both chemical energy. So this is simply two different forms of chemicals that can be converted into energy. So in the case of food, obviously we eat that food. Biochemically we convert that to energy and then we use that energy to walk, to talk, to breathe, to you name it, right? With petroleum, we take that chemical energy and we generally burn it in a combustion engine, internal combustion engine, and we use that again for translocation, for any number of things. But we can convert between these things and we do all of the time. In the United States today, specifically, we will take 40% of our corn crop, 40 million acres of corn, and we will take that corn and we will ferment it into ethanol and we will blend it with our gasoline. So we will produce in the United States this year 14 billion, with a B, billion gallons of corn ethanol that will be blended with our gasoline. So any place in the United States, if you buy a gallon of gasoline, it has at least 5% corn ethanol in it and maybe as high as 10%. Okay? So we actually make a decision as a farmer. Am I going to sell that for chicken feed or cow feed or am I going to sell it to become a fuel? 
We also do the uh, opposite, right? Which is we take fuel and we turn that into food. Now, generally, we don't do that directly. We actually could. We actually could take petroleum and we could chemically make foods that we could eat. But, but in general, we do it by industrial agriculture. This happens to be a picture of, of wheat yields in India over the last 50 years. They've gone up dramatically. You would get the exact same chart if you looked at corn yield in the United States or rice yield in China. What did the Green Revolution do? The Green Revolution brought about enormous increases in agricultural productivity. But here's the really important part of this graph. And that is, we didn't get these increases by increasing the amount of acreage under production. That's the bottom line or by increasing the number of farmers who were that? No, those stayed relatively constant for the last 50 years. In fact, the farming community has decreased worldwide. What increased dramatically? Tractors, chemical fertilizer, gasoline for transportation of food, right? So what the Green Revolution did was it switched us from hand labor to mechanical labor, dramatically increased the yield, but now this directly tied energy and food together. In fact, it tied them together so well that, as I'll show you in a minute, you cannot distinguish between them, okay? The actual cost of energy and the cost of food are now tightly linked. Okay, so why is this a problem? Many people say, well, great, but because of fracking in the United States, we have unlimited oil, right? It's gonna propagate all over the world. I'm gonna show you two graphs that I think define the essential problem of the world today. This is graph number one. This is oil production over the last 10,000 years. Now, I could have put this scale on a million years, you know, the amount of time people have probably been on the planet. I could have put this scale on 300 million years. 300 million years is the amount of time it took for algae to grow in the ocean, settle to the bottom of the ocean, and slowly be converted to petroleum. That's what petroleum is. Petroleum is ancient algae. When I was a kid in America, we had ads by one of the big oil companies that algae was melted dinosaurs. It's not. Algae was around long before the dinosaurs were. Okay, so this is graph one. What is that sharp uptick that happened to start in 1903? That is when Henry Ford started to mass produce automobiles, right? But this was essential part of the Industrial Revolution and actually an essential part of the Green Revolution, okay? Here's graph number two. If I overlay on top of petroleum production over the last 10,000 years, human population, world population, I think it's really easy to see the correlation, right? So specifically what have we done on the planet over the last 110 years is we took inexpensive petroleum and by industrial agriculture and then the green revolution we turned inexpensive fuel into inexpensive food and that allowed world population to hit seven and a half billion people. So that works out really well as long as you have an unlimited supply of petroleum and it's cheap, but we don't have that and we haven't had that in 15 years, right? So here's the final graph of that series. This is the food price index overlaid on top of the oil price index. And you can see now the correlation on these is close to one. And of course that makes sense because you re you're required to use so much energy now for agricultural production, it's the number one input in. Well, if it's the number one input in, then the cost of it is gonna have the largest effect. But there's two really important peaks on this graph, right? One happened in early 2008, and that's when oil hit almost $140 a barrel briefly, right? Then we had the Great Recession, the worldwide recession, and that price dropped down. And then slowly it came back up and peaked again in 2011, right? Now, the World Food Price Index was set at 100 back in 2001. For 2 billion people on this planet, they spend 50% of their income on food. And for the bottom billion people on this planet, they spend 70% of their income on food. So I think it's pretty easy to do the math. If you're spending 70% of your income on food, and the price index goes from 100 to 220, more than doubles, that says you're spending at least 180% of your income on food. Well, that doesn't work out so well for most of the world's population. In fact, there's something called the Arab Spring, which started in 2011, 
which sort of in the, in the press has been contributed, at least in the US press, was contributed to, oh, this is the, you know, the overthrow of dictatorships in the Middle East and people demanding democracy. It had very little to do with that. It had to do with the price of bread in Egypt and the fact that people couldn't afford to eat. And when you can't afford to eat, you blame your government and you throw them out. And that's what they did. So we're actually in a pretty good place right now because the Saudis turned up the spigot on oil, drove the price down to $50 a barrel, and that food price index has come back down, right? But it's not going to stay down forever. So this is the essential problem of the planet today. All of our problems can be associated back to this. It is the cost of energy and therefore the cost of food that has become unaffordable for at least 2 billion people on this planet. That's why we need algae, okay? So that's a long-winded way of saying this is why we need a new green revolution. Okay, so what is that green revolution? Well, I'm going to tell you about one thing that I think about and what I think the green revolution is coming. This is algae as a new photosynthetic biomanufacturing platform. So what does that mean? Photosynthesis powers the world, all right? I know that at least in the United States now, I don't know about here in India, but at least in the United States, there aren't that many students who go in to study photosynthesis anymore. They sort of consider that a done deal. If I'm going to go study something, I'm going to learn how to program a phone to make an app that, you know, distorts my nose and makes me look funny because I'll, be, I'll become rich doing that. But it's this process that powers the world. This is where 100% of our food comes from. This is where 85% of our energy comes from, right? Oil is fossil algae, coal is fossil plants. That is photosynthesis, right? So what I'm proposing is that we use photosynthesis, which powers the world now, but in a new form, right? In algae instead of in terrestrial crops. The inputs are the same. The inputs are water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide, and then a little bit of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphate, potassium. The outputs, as I will show you, can be anything you want, right? The wonderful thing about algae is it's programmable. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So in order to be a new platform, there's a couple of essential functions, a couple of roles that you have to have. One of them is you have to be scalable, right? The best invention in the world, if I created the most fantastic algae in the world th through synthetic biology and through genetic engineering, but I couldn't get it outside of the lab scale, it wouldn't really impact the planet. So we have to have something that can go to mega scale. To put that scale in perspective, the world burns 1.2 trillion, with a T, trillion gallons of petroleum every year and consumes about 700 billion pounds of protein. So those are the kind of scale that you have to impact, right? Algae can do that, and I'll show you some of the scale up that people have started to do, okay? The second thing is it's gotta be productive, right? I can't take all of the terrestrial land that we're using for agriculture now and turn that into algae, right? It's gotta be productive enough, it has to have improved efficiencies that it makes sense to either replace existing systems or to build brand new ones, okay? It has to be sustainable. What does sustainable mean, right? This word gets thrown out a lot. What that means is, I cannot use algae to produce food if my requirement for that is some other limiting resource, whether that be water or whether that be nitrogen. And the wonderful thing about algae is, as shown in this, this picture, right, you'll notice that several of these are marine species. Algae happily grows in salt water, no problem at all, or brackish water, or even wastewater, right? We can take industrial wastewater and feed it to algae. These guys have been on the planet 3.5 billion years. They were the first bacteria to show up, all right? So they have evolved to be little survivors, and they will survive in every niche on this planet. And that's actually essential to their success, I think. The next thing is they're programmable. What does that mean? That means we can engineer them, whether it's through synthetic biology, whether it's genetic engineering, whether it's just selecting a natural strain out there and doing traditional breeding on it, all of those are ways to program, to domesticate algae so it is making a product that we want to use. And then the very last thing, which turns out to be quite convenient for the world, is they're edible, right? They make extremely high quality protein. There are algae that will produce 60% of their biomass as protein, and they're already eaten worldwide now. 
Okay, so then I said I would talk a little bit about biofuels. So that's the reason we're going to use algae. What have we actually made with it? Well, these are pictures actually from my greenhouse at UC San Diego. At scale, it looks a little different than this. But by and large, what you do is you grow the algae up. You harvest that algae out of the water. You separate the lipid component from the protein and carbohydrate component. The proteins and carbohydrates are co-products. You can feed those to chickens or cows or even people can eat them. And then you take the lipid component and you can convert that into fuel if you so choose. So crude algae oil can go directly, directly into an existing oil refinery. In fact, Sapphire Energy, as little as a year ago, was producing about 100 barrels of algae oil per day, shipping that off to a refinery in Texas. They dumped that oil into their refinery stream and out the other end came gasoline and diesel fuel. And that's, that was not a shock to any of us, right? Since petroleum comes from algae oil, all it is is fossil algae oil. The fact that you make it new, it works and it does quite well. Okay? And in fact, we've made fungible fuels, drop-in fuels from that, right? This is a little car uh, that we still have, that Sapphire Energy still has. It's called the Algeus. That's half algae, half Prius. So that's a Toyota Prius. And we run it on algae fuels. We also made jet fuel and flew a jet airplane around a couple years ago. And then one of the other algae companies called Solazyme, they've now changed their name to Terravia, they actually made diesel fuel from algae oil and used that to drive several US Navy boats around, including the destroyer. That big guy in the back in 2013 drove around the coast of California on algae biofuel. So they completely work, no problem at all. Done deal, all right? No new science has to be discovered to make fuel from algae, okay? Why don't we use it? Because it costs too much, right? The number one reason anything isn't used on the planet. There's a cheaper alternative. So this is an analysis that we did back in about 2009. And at that time, as best we could tell from looking at all of the data and what was out there in the production quantities, gasoline from algae was probably about $21 a barrel. And we said, okay, it's $21 a barrel, but we really just started the process. So there's going to be several different layers that we're going to layer on, that we're going to put onto this. So the first is going to be bioprospecting. What does that mean? That means we're going to go out and we're going to look for wild type native strains that are highly productive. Okay? If you look at terrestrial agriculture, you know, modern agriculture, it's driven by five or six crops. It's not driven by a thousand different plants, right? We selected a few, very few of them that were highly productive, and then we concentrated on making those better. And we said, well, we're going to do the same thing with algae. So just with bioprospecting, we're going to predict, we're going to drop that price from 21 down to about $7. And we did that right away. It actually took less than a year. We went out and found strains. They were three times more productive. They produced more oil. Then by engineering, and by engineering, I don't mean genetic engineering. I mean engineering processes by making better ponds, better growth systems, better utilization of gas exchange, et cetera. We're going to improve that again, and we did. And by 2014, we were down to about $6 a barrel, and we were on a very good path, right? If you remember in 2014, petroleum was $100 a barrel. And in fact, Sapphire Energy, the company that I had founded, was in negotiations with Exxon and the Saudis to build a 10,000-acre facility in Saudi Arabia. Now, Exxon wanted that as proof of concept that you could make biofuels from algae. The Saudis wanted it because they wanted the protein component out of it. Because they knew that they could feed algae to tilapia or to shrimp, export the shrimp and keep the tilapia for the local population. So they were thinking about it even back then as a food play. But what happened is starting in 2014, the price of oil started dropping. And in fact, by 2015, all investment into algae biofuels had completely dried up. And so the price stays about the same, at about $6 a gallon right now, I would guess. But the nice thing is, in between 2007 and 2014, about $2 billion worldwide got put into algae research, and that completely accelerated the field. It allowed us to domesticate strains, it allowed us to develop the genetic technologies, the engineering technologies, the systems to grow these things. So by 2014, we were in very good shape to start making lots of different products. So one of the problems that we had, and I think that many industries have, is they look at a problem like climate change and the cost of fuel. And they say, oh, 
Algae can answer both of those. If we make fuels from algae, we will sequester CO2 out of the atmosphere. And if we make fuel from algae, we, will com you know, we, will, we can outcompete fossil fuel. The problem is, in order to get economies of scale, you have to get to scale. In order to get to scale, you have to have low enough costs that people will buy that product. So you simply cannot jump from where you are today to compete with, with a commodity on the scale of fuels in one jump. It just doesn't work. This is one of my favorite graphs. This happens to be a picture of the cost of photovoltaic cells versus utilization, but it beautifully shows how every technology, every technology, this is true of cars, this is true of cell phones, this is true of you name it, all of them follow this same path. And that path is you start at a very high price because you're in the very beginning of the development of it. It's not to say that there isn't some utilization of those, right? So back in 1975, we had two megawatts of photovoltaic panels and they were up, but they were used on very exclusive things. NASA put, all, put them on all their satellites because they could afford to pay the outrageous price of $101 you know, a watt. But over time, we made improvements in that, first dramatically and then slowly. But at some point you cross over, which we did in about 2005, and it became cheap enough that people started to deploy it. How fast are photovoltaic panels being deployed now? They are being deployed so fast in the United States that in California, every single day this summer, we had something called negative pricing. Only an economist could come up with a name like this. What is negative pricing? Negative pricing is you produce more electricity than people can consume. So every day between about 10 a.m. and about noon, we produce so much electricity that the utilities charge you to put that electricity onto the grid. They don't buy it from you and pay you for it. They charge you to put it on the grid. That's negative pricing, okay? Every single night this year in Texas, between midnight and 6 a.m., there has been negative pricing from wind power. Within the next five years in the United States, we will have free electrons because of these two technologies, all right? But that was unheard of even 10 years ago, right? Because we need these economies of scale to drive that price down. But at some point, you hit a tipping point, and then everything converts that way. This is actually, by the way, fantastic news for the planet. Because in the United States, in the next five years, we will likely stop producing internal combustion engines and turn all of our cars into electric cars, right? And there's two reasons we do that. One, because once you get electrons for free, well, that's cheaper than gas, no matter how cheap it is. And the second thing is electric engines turn out to be much, much more efficient than internal combustion engines, and they last much longer. Okay, but this is our challenge, right? How do we get there in algae? How do we get there in any commodity? So the way we do that is we start by making products that are very low volume, but very high cost, right? And then over time, as we increase our learning, we drive the price down and that allows us to increase the scale. Eventually we will get to the scales that we can compete with fossil fuel, all right? Although I will tell you, I believe it's unlikely we will ever sell algae as fossil fuel because I think we'll get to the point which is right below that, which is animal feed and other sources of protein, and I think it'll be very difficult for us to satisfy that market. Why is that? That's because one very interesting thing happens to the planet over the last couple years, and that is as people get richer, they tend to eat more protein, right? And the planet's getting richer. China and India, the economies are going up very rapidly, right? And as they do, people demand more food. So I think the demand for protein food will be, the, will be the commodity that we sell into as algae long, long before we sell into fuel. Okay, so let me tell you technically what do we do. So what do you do? You decide what product you want to make, and I'm going to show you a couple that we have picked. You then enable the algae to produce that. That could be by genetic engineering, but it could be by traditional breeding and selection. You then have to grow those algae at scale, and there are several different ways we can grow them. The picture that I have shown there happens to be fermentation tanks. You could grow these things in open pond. You then harvest the algae. You do whatever post-production processing you need to do, and then you sell that product, all right? So let me tell you about a couple of products that we've made, okay? So one of them, as I said, well, algae are edible. So one of the, the 
kind of the, one of the first things we looked at, well, okay, what are proteins where being edible would be an enormous advantage, but they still have very high value? And right away, we identified colostrum proteins. So colostrum is the first milk that all mammals make. Humans make it, but so do every other mammal on the planet. So do mice, dogs, cats, blue whales. And there are about 20 proteins that are conserved in every single mammal. Now, as a biologist, I have an expression that I always use. I never fight evolution. Okay? Biology had millions of years to get it right, and they've never get it wrong. If there are 20 proteins that are conserved in every mammal, those proteins are essential for mammalian development. Okay? Those proteins are not found in baby formula. Right? They're found in human breast milk. They are not found in baby formula. So we looked at those and said, okay, here's the first proteins we're going to make. And we picked two of them. One was called mammary-associated amyloid, and the other is osteopontin. We transformed our algae to make sure they could produce that. We grew the algae up. And then we did a really interesting experiment. So mammary-associated amyloid, this protein had been identified by a group in Nebraska as a key component of colostrum that when they isolated, when they purified that protein from colostrum and fed it to pigs, they showed they could get a reduction in bacterial diarrhea. The reason for that is because that protein passes through your stomach, gets into your intestine, binds to a little receptor, and stimulates your intestines to secrete mucus, mucin layer. And that gives you a physical barrier from bacterial or viral adhesion. And if you don't have the bacteria or the virus adhering to the wall of the intestine, they can't squirt their proteins in and give you diarrhea. So it's not that you don't get the bacteria. You still get those. You just don't get diarrhea. So we produced the algae. We fed these to pigs. And then we measured the cases of clinical diarrhea in those pigs. And what you see is that little happy pig. Why is that little pig so happy? He's happy because he and all of his siblings had a 60% reduction in the incidence of diarrhea. And even the ones that got it only had it for 40% of the time of the other ones. So why is that important? That is this, this, by the way, is a fantastic product for India. All right? Why is that? What does that mean? That means we produce really inexpensively because you can grow algae for a dollar a kilogram and your dose on this is less than a gram of the algae. So you're talking about 0.1 cent a dose, okay? So what do you do? You eat that, stimulates mucin, and then even though the bacteria is in the environment, whether it's in the water or the food, you have a 60% less chance to get bacterial diarrhea. And many of you will know that it's actually diarrhea is the number one cause of infant mortality. It's not starvation, it's not malaria, it's dehydration from getting diarrhea. Five million kids per year die from that. So an enormous opportunity here. For a technology that's relatively sophisticated on the front end, meaning that we have to engineer algae to do this, but relatively un unsophisticated on the, on the back end, on the back side, right? So that's one of the products we make. Here's another one of the products we make. As I said, petroleum comes from algae. Any product you can make from petroleum, you can eventually make from algae. Now, I'm at the University of California, San Diego. San Diego is on the coast, and many of our faculty and most of our students are surfers. Okay? So we looked around and we said, well, what's the most important product in the world? Okay? So that product is polyurethane, and I'll show you why in a second. So if you take oil from algae and you do something, right, called an epoxidation and then a ring opening, you end up with what's called a polyhydroxyl fatty acid or a polyol. And if you take a polyol and a cross-linking agent, you get polyurethane. And polyurethane is the number one component in a surfboard. So those two surfboards, those are made from algae. We gave one of them to the mayor of San Diego and the other one sits in my office, right? But now we make these things commercially, right? And in fact, you can buy an algae-based surfboard. Once we made that surfboard, we were approached by Adidas. And Adidas said, hey, if you can make surfboards from algae, then you can make soft foam polyurethanes, you can make shoe soles. So we started a collaboration with them, and we now make algae-based flip-flops or algae-based sandals. So this is actually a picture of our prototype algae-based sandal. I took that picture last Friday. That is on a little island in the Maldives, a little deserted island that I sailed up to. 
about, drove up to in a motorboat, right? But why is this important? This is important because that, that sandal is biodegradable. It's sustainable, so the carbon in it comes from the atmosphere, and because we made it from algae oil, it's biodegradable. Why is that essential? Do you see this picture in the corner? It's a little, probably a little hard to see. Those are dead flip-flops washed up on a beach. This is an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, 12 miles from the equator, and it is covered with dead flip-flops, right? This is part of the plastic pollution that covers the oceans, right? That sandal right there, left on the beach, would degrade in two or three months. It won't degrade instantly. You can wear it around and it's not gonna biodegrade on your feet, but if it stays wet for any length of time, it will biodegrade. So those are a couple of the products that we make. And I, I think the important thing that I wanna say is, I believe today we could make any product that we want in algae. If you can make a surfboard and a flip-flop and you can make a nutraceutical and you can make a baby formula ingredient, I believe you can make anything, all right? But I wanna end up by telling you that, uh, that just briefly, an outdoor field trial that we did on this. And the reason that I wanna say this is because new technologies, you know, they're great, but if we don't prove that they're safe, they're simply not gonna be accepted, all right? So even though it was very, it's still relatively early on in algae biotech, we decided to do a, an outdoor field trial of a genetically engineered algae, all right? So this is just a picture of our site at UC San Diego. Uh, we had eight different tanks uh, in containment, but open to the environment, right? And then all of these little blue things are the traps we put out because we wanted to do two things. One, we wanted to measure what was the phenotype stability of the algae in an outdoor trial? And then second, we wanted to measure how fast does that transgenic algae escape from our ponds and end up in those little traps, all right? So here was the construction. As I said, we had secondary containment. We, we lined this and then put the tubs inside of that, filled that with sand. Here's our tub. So we had four tubs of wild type and four tubs of genetically engineered algae, okay? We then obtained EPA approval which, you know, although here it says it took a month, it was actually about 100 days, about three months, a very close discussion with these guys. And we started with traits that were pretty simple. So we put in a green fluorescent protein and we put in an enzyme that modifies lipid metabolism. And we specifically did that because, because it was the first trial. And even though we could, we could anticipate that if these things got out, they weren't gonna cause trouble, we still put in some pretty benign traits, okay? But we got approval. We put this out in the field, and then two really important things, okay? So one, here's our production. So here's wild type in blue, here's our transgenic in green. So the first thing we discovered that was when you take a line, you take a wild type line and make it transgenic, chances are you make it a little sicker than the starting parent. And sure enough, once we got it outside, it didn't grow as well, okay? But it still grew, right? The second thing we had in was here's our green fluorescent protein. It's a little hard to see. It was stable for 50 days. And our lipid modifying enzyme was also stable for 50 days. So that's kind of nice to know. I mean, we predicted it. We put in stable genes. We made sure they were selected. But sure enough, they stayed around for 50 days. Here's the really interesting thing. We looked at those traps going out 5, 10, and 50 meters out, right? And what we found out was that here's our transgenic line. It traveled very slowly. Now, there are 800 liters of media in each one of those and algae at density is 10 to the seventh per mil, 10 to the ninth per liter, 800 liters in four tubes, trillions of cells, and yet after 50 days, after 40 days, they had barely gone five meters. But the wild type algae, we found it in all the traps right away. We were a little shocked by that. It's like, well, okay, we get it. The genetically engineered strain isn't quite growing as well, but why is our wild type showing up quick? So then we went back and sequenced every one of those traps. And what we found out was that almost immediately, every single trap we set out was immediately populated with large numbers of algae species, right? So here's a trap up here. So this is 50 meters to the north. There were 59 different algal species in there. Now this is in San Diego, which is practically a desert. And we ran this field trial in September and October. There had not been any rain. What does that tell you? That tells you that algae worldwide are raining down out of the atmosphere virtually all the time. 
These things are just up in the jet stream flowing around. These have nothing to do with any algae that we put out there. These are wild type algae just blowing into our traps, okay? The second thing that we found out was we went and took water from five different local lakes and we asked two really simple questions. One was, what happens if we inoculate? Now we did not inoculate the local lakes. We took water from the lakes, brought them back to the lab and then inoculated our algae into that. So here's just really quickly, what does that mean? Here's our, here's our wild type and transgenic algae and here's three different lakes that are very low in nutrients, all right? But they still have algae in them. So here's the native populations is that black one. What happens when you do that? Well, the inoculated algae go down and the native guys go up. The native guys ate our, our genetically engineered algae. They had evolved in a system, right, in these lakes that were low nutrients to survive really well. Our guys hadn't been. Our guys came from nutrient rich media. They were not ready for the harsh realities out here. They went down, the native guys came up. We had two lakes which were rich in nitrogen because they were in areas where there was agricultural runoff. So now that those lake waters look much more like the media we grew them in. And when, when we inoculated our guys into those, they stayed about the same, okay? The last thing is we looked at the diversity. And what happened was when we put our algae in, it simply did not outcompete any of the native species. So it didn't change the diversity. It didn't change much at all. They sort of grew and they persisted. They stayed there, but it did not have a dramatic impact. And that's kind of what we would have predicted. Okay, so what did we learn from this? We learned that heterologous genes and phenotypes are stable and outdoors for at least 50 days. That was kind of nice to know. We learned that GE algae did not grow as well outdoors as the wild type. Maybe we shouldn't have been too surprised about that. We probably have to go back and engineer that strain a little better. We did learn that both of these algae can disperse, but at least from rapidly growing ponds that are nutrient rich, they don't go very far and they don't go very fast where other algae showed up almost immediately. We suspect that's from other ponds that have dried out and those algae have gone into some sort of spore form and now they're blowing in the wind trying to find a new place to live, okay? And we also found out that GE algae can produce in local waters but they didn't, they didn't overpopulate it. And I wanna end with just, so we published this paper but here's kind of the important thing. It took 20 months, four journals and 18 rounds of review to publish this paper. This was the most difficult paper that I have ever published in 30 years, and I've got 175 publications. This one took twice as long as anything. Why? Because every single time we got at least one reviewer who had a religious belief that GE algae should not be allowed outdoors, and they didn't care about any facts whatsoever. They simply kept repeating, you shouldn't have done this experiment. You'll never know whether it's safe or not. No, no, no. Okay, so, but we published it anyway. We put out a press release and what did people say? The shocking thing is almost everybody got it right, including many of the Greenpeace types, right? Most of them had comments that were something like this. If we're gonna produce food, fuel, and feed for the world from algae, it will likely require some sort of genetic engineering. Like most of them kind of got that. And they said, and we think this is a reasonable first trial. Only one group, the National Resources Defense Council, this is a quote from the woman who runs that, who's an attorney, by the way, a lawyer, and she said, many algae have horizontal gene transfer. So that makes genetic engineering extremely risky. Uh, wait a minute. If they already have horizontal gene transfer, that means they're taking genes from other organisms, and all I'm doing is being more precise. Uh, how does that make it more risky? I don't know. But here's my favorite one. With climate change in complete chaos, this is no time to experiment with algae. So apparently we have to wait until the environment is completely collapsed and the planet is near death and then I can do my experiments, okay? So I know I ran a little bit over time. I'm gonna end it right there and just saying, I honestly believe that what the planet needs is protein. And I think, I don't know if you guys know what this is or not, the Impossible Burger. This is the very trendy thing in California. This is where a group up in San Francisco has taken textured vegetable protein and used leg hemoglobin, by the way, produced in yeast, because it turns out hemoglobin is a really important component in meat to give it the flavor when it cooks. So that is a completely fake, fake, that's a protein, that, that is a plant-based protein hamburger that tastes more or less like hamburger, and it is the hottest thing out there. If we can use algae,
for protein replacement, all right? It is 50 times, 50 times more efficient than cows at producing that protein, all right? This will be a game changer for the planet. So I apologize for running over. I will end it right there, and I guess we'll have questions at the end. Thank you.